Namaste. So I get some questions from time to time. Like, what is it like to be enlightened? What is the experience, really, this is what they're asking? Or the phenomenology, huh? the direct experience, not what you think about it, but the experience itself. What is that like? Well, <laughs> this is one of those questions, you know, that supposes or assumes that I'm in some certain state, right? And I always hesitate to answer them because people have different ideas or expectations about what enlightenment is supposed to be like. Well, it's not like anything. <laughs> It's a completely unique experience, and it can't be, how can I say, it's not always the same for everybody. So it can't be abstracted into a template that you can fit, you know, on everybody. So, anyway, all I can talk about is my experience of enlightenment. And I hope that's good enough to satisfy the questioner. So, what is my experience of enlightenment? Well, nothing changes, but everything changes. Nothing changes about the body. Huh? The body is still there. It still has to eat, drink, sleep, go to the bathroom, take a shower, get exercise, you know, all the things that bodies do. But my attitude toward the body, my experience of the body is very different. It's like before I thought I was the body, but now it's like the body is something over there. Huh? It's something I have to take care of to do my job, my seva, but it's not me. It's like a tool. I used to be a musician, and I, I would take very good care of my instrument, always cleaning it, polishing it, oiling the parts that need it when, when they needed it. And by taking care of the instrument, I felt more competent as a musician. I had an instrument that wouldn't let me down. So, in the same way, I care for the body nicely. I feed it, you know, when necessary, I clothe it. <laughs> when it's not necessary, well, that's another story. But I get enough rest. Huh? I, I love my body in the same way that I love my instrument. It's important to me, but it's not me. It's a tool. It's a tool to make beautiful things. As an artist, really where I'm coming from is mostly the attitude of an artist. So just like a painter takes care of his palette and his paints and his canvas and his frames and it's like that. In the same way as a musician takes care of his instruments. So I take care of this body. And it's, it's useful, you know, it can do so many things. But I don't identify with the body. I don't think this body is me. I don't even really think that it's mine. So although my experience when looking out through the senses is pretty much the same, my attitude toward those experiences is very different. So then what about when looking inside? Well, if I look inside, first of all, I don't find anything that 
resembles a self, an I, an individual. It seems like this body, this mind, which actually I don't find a mind either. I, I find many thoughts. <laughs> and we could, I suppose, abstract them into a thing called mind. But let's be clear that the, the mind is an abstraction. Just like the concept of a body is an abstraction. A body is an, is an aggregate, the Buddha teaches us of many independent parts. In the same way, a mind is an aggregate of many independent thoughts. So we shouldn't be uh, too hung up on the mind or proud of the mind or thinking, oh, I'm so intelligent or any of those vain thoughts. No, uh, to have a mind means we're stupid. <laughs> the fact that we have a mind means that we're not yet fully emancipated. Uh -huh. But anyway, when I look inside, I see light. Lots of light. And depending on how I direct my attention, I see the light either kind of mixed with shadows, vague things that move and, and are never still, are never clear either. But if I direct my attention towards the top of the head, then I see like full light. Uh, blindingly, I mean, but it is not blind, it's not hot light, it's cool light. Oh, it's hard to explain. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, at first, I used to see this light in little flashes. And then I used to see it more like a focused thing, you know, like a ball, kind of. And that gradually grew and grew through my practice until now it's like that's all there is inside, is this light. And I know what it is. Yeah. It's the light of the self. Not myself, the self. Being reflected off of the mind, the purified mind. Now the mind is maya. The mind is not real, but it seems to exist because it reflects the light of the self. Then some people ask, well, if you're really enlightened, then why do you wear Bhasma and these different religious symbols and stuff like this? Well, these are tools. Just like the body is a tool. Bhasma is a very powerful tool. I'm going to do a, another video or two or three <laughs> on Bhasma because uh, this Bhasma Tripundra is extremely powerful. I've been researching in the scriptures, and some of the things the scriptures say about it are just amazing. So I think everybody deserves to know this. And you know, you can order Basma from Amazon.com. <laughs> Anywhere in the world that has Amazon. So there's really no excuse not to use it. Anyway, so the same with the beads. I chant on these beads every day. I chant my mantra. This is one of the sources of my power. And I want to say this, that, you know, I'm going to get a lot of views on this video because it has a catchy name. Uh, but the real videos, the videos that give the secrets, very few people watch. See? Like, it's really nice that I attained this state, you know, whatever you want to call it, enlightenment or whatever. But how did I attain it? What were the tools? What were the methods? Well, I give that in my other videos, especially Lalita Sahasranamam. But very few people watch it. Or my earlier videos, years ago, 
on the Buddha's teaching and like that, get hardly any views. See, but these are the secrets. These are the tools. These are the methods that give you the power of enlightenment. So, you know, it's like people want a shortcut. People want to get, maybe, maybe I'll drop a hint, you know, that will <laughs> help you jump up to some state. But if you're not qualified, you're just going to fall down again. So why don't you do the methods, research the information. It's all here on our channel. And get the, you start using the methods that get you to enlightenment. See, but nobody wants to do the work. Everybody just wants a shortcut, an easy way. I'm telling you, there ain't no shortcut. I had to struggle many, many years, decades. I had to struggle. I had to struggle with religious organizations. I had to struggle with learning Sanskrit. I had to struggle with my own mind in meditation. I had to struggle with my body that just wanted to run off like an animal. <laughs> but gradually, all these passion and ignorance has fallen away. Why? Because I do the methods of purification, the basma, the mantras, see, the chanting of the thousand names, the study every day, the deep thinking, looking within, huh? trying to understand what is what. What in the scriptures is a literal description and what is a metaphorical description, see? All these things have to be thought about, have to be turned over in the mind, just like a gardener turns over the soil in his garden to keep out the weeds and to keep the soil fresh and aerated. See, this is all the work that has to be done to actually attain this enlightenment, to actually attain any kind of self-realization. So, what does enlightenment look like? Or what is the experience of enlightenment? It is the result of years and decades of dedicated work and service. Huh? One has to not only benefit oneself, but also give these tools and secrets to others so that they can benefit. And this is what generates the good karma that makes you qualified for enlightenment, that brings you to deserve enlightenment in the eyes of God. Because the purpose of God is to bring everyone to enlightenment. And the more that we engage with that purpose, the more that we help others on their path, then the more our own path is subtly facilitated in ways that we can't even see. So there's a certain amount of magic. I don't use that word lightly. It means exactly what it means. There's some magic here. There's some things that you do that don't have any apparent result. But then over time, you can see actually they are very powerful. So methods like mantras, like sacrifices like Homa, the chanting of the prayers and stotrams, the study of the scriptures, huh? even reading all these old stories that you have no idea whether they're true or not, huh? and looking for the meaning in them. All these things gradually add up over a long period of time to qualify you for enlightenment. Enlightenment is a gift. It's not something you do or make or have. It's not something that you transform into. These are all mistaken ideas about enlightenment. Enlightenment is a gift. It's a blessing that you have to qualify yourself to receive. You have to become pure enough to hold it, to cherish it, to deserve it in the first place. And when you are, then 
God or goddess gives that enlightenment free of charge, spontaneously, either suddenly or a little bit at a time. And then one day you notice, hey, I'm free. And that's the essence of the experience of enlightenment. Aum Tetzet. Aum Shakti Aum.